Welcome back to the Meddling Kids Podcast, your groovy review of Scooby-Doo. I'm Julie Kin, and today we are reviewing The Warlock of Wimbledon. And everybody, we're almost to the end of Scooby-Doo. Where are you? Are we going to get any of that gray dog who keeps showing up in the introductory imagery? I sure hope so. We only have one more episode left. Otherwise, it's false advertising. So you'll never believe it, but our episode begins on a cloudy night in a creepy forest. A man in a white sweatsuit, this is Nick, is running alongside a teenager in a groovy green and yellow sweatsuit, urging him to run faster. That's some good coaching. The youngin is named Jimmy, and he's wearing some really unfortunate glasses. They both have British accents, and the older man wants Jimmy to work on his stamina. Jimmy assures him that winning at Wimbledon is his dream, so nothing would prevent him from running fast through a forest at night. These dudes pass by some ancient-looking stones that are sort of a Stonehenge knockoff. I'm hoping this takes an outlander turn, but instead Jimmy finds a weird red and white scepter laying on what I can only presume was a site of ancient human sacrifice. Jimmy picks up the scepter, and the top part looks like a red helmet. The eyes of the helmet start glowing, and steam comes out of the mouth. Jimmy freaks out and tosses it like a javelin at another ancient stone. We see a small explosion, and now a big dude is standing there, holding the staff. His mask looks just like the mini mask on the end of the staff, and he's got a black goatee, a purple cape, purple sleeves, purple leggings, and a bright orange and yellow tunic. Best of all, he's wearing thigh-high brown stripper boots. This is a lot of look. Okay, scrap that. The best part isn't the boots. It's his companion, a waist-high reddish-brown dog with big jowls, fangs, and bright yellow eyes. I cannot wait to see Scooby interact with this doggy dude. The Boots dude announces, I am the warlock Anthos, rising at last from my age-long sleep. Two things. One, he's speaking with an American or possibly Canadian accent. And two, if I had just awoken from an age-long sleep, my first order of business would be a nice long pee-pee. But he goes on to say that he's back to fulfill the curse against the Pelton family. Jimmy is slowly absorbing this. He says, Peltons? I'm a Pelton. Boots dude is like, yes, the last of the Peltons. Kind of cruel to rub it in that poor Jimmy is an orphan. He tosses back the scepter and tells Jimmy that as long as he has the scepter, he is doomed. Nick, the coach, advises him to get rid of it, so Jimmy tosses it away. But Bootsy doesn't seem bothered and assures Jimmy he's still doomed, even as Jimmy and Nick run away. The scene shifts, and we see the mystery machine. Velma kindly fills us in. They aren't far from the ancient druid ruins of Rothmore. You know, that place where American weirdos and their huge hounds like to hassle tennis pros? The mystery machine nearly misses hitting two pedestrians. Oh, it's Nick and Jimmy. What do you know? Jimmy asks for help. If I were in his shoes, I'd keep mum about my recent experience and just ask for a ride. But Jimmy can tell this group of odd American teenagers and their doggo are totally trustworthy and possibly obsessed with the supernatural. Please, we are attacked by the warlock Anthos, as though everyone knows that warlock. Also, I'm not sure that taunting you with a scepter counts as an attack, but I get that perception counts for a lot. Velma explains to Scooby that a warlock is a magician, and Scooby communicates his understanding by pulling an irate rabbit out of a stocking cap. Everyone gets in the mystery machine, and Jimmy Pelton introduces his manager, Nick Thomas. Jimmy is wearing too much foundation or powder because his face is a couple of shades lighter than his neck. Don't feel bad, dude. I'm terrible with makeup, too. Fred knows Jimmy's name because he's playing at Wimbledon tomorrow. They drive to a cool castle that Jimmy explains his family had lost some time ago, but that he had just purchased. A grouchy man silently opens the gate and allows them to pass, while staring menacingly at Scooby. Jimmy is unconcerned and says, That's John, the gatekeeper. He has on a lovely powder blue turtleneck, and his hair looks like Morrissey's, but we're supposed to think of him as creepy, not hot. Settle down. So my husband, Olaf, that's not his real name, it's just what he wants to be called, just informed me that Morrissey is no longer super cool because apparently he's racist. So sorry for thinking you were hot, Morrissey. 
Back to the action. Although the castle looks creepy and is surrounded by gnarled trees, inside we see the kids and Coach Nick in a snug sitting room enjoying tea. Jimmy has good news. His housekeeper's pastries are smashing. She is a kind woman in a revolting pink dress, and she's excited to fatten up Shaggy and Scooby, much to their delight. They thank Mrs. Warren and scarf down a plate of cookies. She advises Jimmy to look at his tea leaves to learn more about the warlock. We see the dregs at the bottom of his cup shift to look like the warlock's head. I can't tell if this is really happening, or if we're seeing through her perspective, or if I'm having a visual hallucination. She says, oh, I see danger. Must be the grim, a la Harry Potter. Suddenly, a set of French doors bursts open, and Scooby and Shaggy are scared into knocking over the tea tray. There stands Bootsy Warlock and his big, bad woofer. He laughs evilly, as is required of most Scooby-Doo villains, and announces, You will never be free of the curse of Anthos. You are doomed. He and his spirit animal disappear, but the staff remains, sort of floating in midair. I'm not sure what happens to the staff, because Fred, Velma, and Daphne, and the Brits, run off through the house grounds to find the intruders, while Shaggy slowly strolls around and Scooby pretends to eat a bowl of pea soup because the fog is so thick. Meanwhile, the kids hear someone near the gatekeeper's house shouting for help because of, and this is in quotes, the devil's hound! The kids arrive at the small home and find it's been trashed. There are weird-looking red paw prints all over the place on the ground and on the walls, as though gravity doesn't matter to this pup. Now, the prints don't really look like dog paws. There's no dew claw, and the pad looks disproportionately plump, kind of like what I imagine panda prints to look like, so maybe there's a killer panda. John Gatekeeper is gone, too, obviously. A boot is covered in thick red stuff, but Velma tells us it's just red mud, not ketchup as we had feared. Fred is thrilled to follow the trail of paw prints. The prints stop outside near a random wall or building. The kids' horror about the gatekeeper's disappearance is abated by the arrival of a bizarre man on a bicycle. Now, remember, this is supposed to be like in the middle of the night, okay? It's Mr. Burgess, Jimmy's solicitor, which means lawyer, who is dressed like a Portland hipster, complete with teal blue pants, teal blue vest, teal blue bow tie, and a bowler hat and a handlebar mustache. And he just rides up on his bicycle like la 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 la. Mr. Burgess has a calming effect on everyone. He suggests they go back to the house so they can fill him in. Scooby and Shaggy relax in front of the fireplace, while Mr. Burgess hears it all. Oh, dear me. I always feared this would happen. Really? Why didn't you do something about it, dude? What's the point of having a solicitor if you're not going to spill the beans about historic curses? So, apparently in ancient time, and I'm guessing that means druid, this land belonged to the Anthos family. Now, Anthos is the warlock's last name. But they were accused of witchcraft, and the Peltons drove them from their land. So what I'm hearing is that Jimmy's ancestors were a bunch of jerks who falsely accused the Anthos family of using magic so they could steal their property. Boo! Hiss! A curse on you, Peltons! Unfortunately, the Peltons couldn't keep hold of their stolen land because they were cursed by debt, presumably by spending beyond their means rather than a magical curse, and the land stood ownerless until Jimmy bought it. I hope this episode ends with him returning the Anthos clan to their rightful ancestral home along with a formal apology. Jimmy must have learned financial management from his family before they all kick the bucket because his solicitor informs him he is out of dough. Unless he wins the match tomorrow, he won't be able to pay the mortgage. The solicitor, Mr. Burgess, says goodnight in his cheerful way, despite the fact that a man's just been abducted. And Shaggy and Scooby try to get rid of the cursed staff again, this time by throwing it into a pond. We see the warlock Bootsy rise up from the pond, grab the staff as it's, you know, floating on the water, and throw it back into Scooby's mouth. He and Shaggy run away and meet up with the rest of the gang who are watching Coach Nick give Jimmy terrible advice. He wants Jimmy to practice even more, even though it's the night before his big match. Teenagers need a lot of sleep, so I recommend against this course of action. 
Fred is really disturbed to see the staff again since he had commanded Shaggy and Scooby to get rid of it. He tosses it aside, and suddenly Bootsy is there, too, laughing excessively. Jimmy wants to confront him, but the warlock's dog starts growling and sort of attacks Nick, and we're supposed to think he's dragged away, although we didn't see it happen. Nick has vanished. The staff is still there, and Jimmy breaks it in anger. As he tosses down the pieces, we see the eyes on the little helmet on top start glowing again, and we fade to commercial. Have you ever been reading through a stack of comics and thought, hey, maybe I should see what this Arkham Asylum game is all about? Or been playing Marvel vs. Capcom and felt like you were at a real disadvantage because you didn't know who half the characters were? Well, Play Comics is the show for you. I'm Chris, and each episode, I take a look at video games based on comic book properties and how well they stick to that source material. So, whether you know the comics and want to actually learn how these games work, or know the games and want to know what the hell is going on, go check out Play Comics at playcomics.com, the Brain Trust Bros Network, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Hi, I'm Tyler. And I'm Brian. And we're starting a new music-focused podcast called The Discographers. For our first 10-part series, we'll focus on Trent Reznor and his band Nine Inch Nails. We will explore the personal story of his career and look at his music on a technical level. Check us out on Twitter, at DiscographerPod, for details. Hey, I'm Dustin. And I'm Steve. And we host the Wedding Photo Hangover Podcast, a lighthearted look at the vast world of wedding photography. That's what we're doing? I thought we were making a podcast about drinking beers, flying drones. Did you even take yours out of the box Coping with your post-wedding hangover, social media etiquette, and wearing moon shoes. They're not moon shoes, Steve. They're just... But seriously, check us out if you want to have a laugh and learn a thing or two about shooting weddings and running a wedding photography business. You can find the Wedding Photo Hangover Podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. We're back from commercial. Jimmy and the Scooby gang are at the Druid Stones looking for clues instead of sleeping and resting up for the big match. Jimmy tries to give a little history lesson, but it's very short since no one knows where the stones come from. That's the end of the history lesson. Thelma notices that the mud is red, just like on the gatekeeper's boot and house. Jimmy says this is the only part of the country with mud this color. Tiff, you'll have to tell us if that part's true. We hear a howl in the distance, and it sounds like it's coming from Jimmy's house, so they all run back. The scepter slash staff is waiting for them at the gate, and it's unbroken. Plus, there's a note attached. If you play tomorrow, it will mean your doom. Wow, this warlock guy cares a lot about tennis. Mr. Burgess, he of the handlebar mustache and bicycle, is back. I guess he went away and just kind of came back a couple hours later. And he calmly tells Jimmy that this curse is just too strong and that he should not play Wimbledon tomorrow. Jimmy refuses to back down. boy, that's a spirit. Stiff upper lip. Sometime later, Jimmy, Fred, and Daphne drive off in the mystery machine while Velma, Scooby, and Shaggy stay behind to look for clues. Perhaps bolstered by Jimmy's courage, Shaggy puts his foot down and refuses to help search for clues. Unfortunately, he puts his foot down rather too hard and stomped a hole through the earth. He and Scooby fall into a tunnel below. It's a secret chamber, and Velma pops down to join them. The floor is ankle high in sawdust, which would freak me out because just think of all the critters that are probably nesting in there. Velma surmises that it's a carpenter's old wood shop. But why are there wooden poles and paddles down here? Is this Fifty Shades of Scooby? On the work table, Velma finds a receipt for one pair of special lenses. Then Scooby finds some boots with red paw-shaped stamps on the bottom. Their discussion of these clues is interrupted by Bootsy Warlock's evil laughing. He joins them calmly, and the kids escape, aided by Scooby's gigantic sneeze that makes a huge sawdust cloud. The heroes jump into a rowboat because apparently in this underground tunnel it's connected by water. And Scooby and Shaggy row quickly away with Velma in the boat too. But the mean guy and his dog are on their tail. They row out of the underground area and into a lake and then down a waterfall. They survive and what luck. The tide has brought them right to Wimbledon. 
we now see the match. And the Scooby gang are sitting right on the court, you know, where the ball girls and ball boys usually go. Scooby's lack of inclination to chase balls or play keep away is yet more testament to the fact that he's the world's best dog. Or a human trapped in a dog's body. Ooh, I feel a new theory brewing. Jimmy appears to be winning the game until he's distracted by seeing Bootsy Warlock in the stands. He sees him in a couple of different spots and he just lets the balls fly by while he stands there kind of slack-jawed. The kids don't see Bootsy and they think that Jimmy is just losing it or he's gone barking as they say in England. Jimmy continues to play terribly. He falls down and his glasses land right by Velma. She picks them up and discovers a clue. When Jimmy asks for his glasses back, she gives him her glasses. And like a dummy, he's just like, oh, okay. Dude needs LASIK. Meanwhile, Scooby and Shaggy are enjoying hot dogs by the concession stands. And the meanie red dog comes up and chomps Shaggy's wiener. Hot dog. He thinks the growl he heard is just Scooby's hungry tummy. Scooby insists it's not him. And they turn to see the two-legged and four-legged villains. They have a chase through the huge locker rooms. Please, I need costumes. Okay, we sort of get costumes. Bootsy is looking through all the lockers for them and finds them standing side by side, scrunched into one, wearing tennis gear. They say things like, I say I'll jump after you. Bootsy breaks the fourth wall with the audience and then chases them some more. They run into a court and end up in a doubles match. Meanwhile, Jimmy is doing great until the meanie dude comes right onto the court and shouts that the curse remains and that he must lose. We don't know if Bootsy gets wrestled down by a ball girl or what, because the scene switches back to Scooby and Shaggy, who are sneaking around a tennis court. Warning, things get bonkers here, so please pay close attention. Scooby's snout gets stuck in a tennis player's racket, and thus he gets served across multiple courts and onto the mean red dog's back. Scooby rides him like a bucking bull for a while. Bootsy tries to get his dog and ends up flying behind them both while holding on to the red dog's tail. Undistracted, Jimmy wins the game. Scooby Bootsy and Meanie Red Dog all crash into a hot dog stand. Scooby pops up and we see all his face orifices are stuffed with wieners. Hot dogs. He sucks them in through his mouth and ears. They just go right on in through his ears and he looks thrilled. The Bootsy Warlock and the Mean Red Dog also pop up. Velma first unmasks the Devil Hound. And we find it's just this random old Basset Hound. I don't think we saw him earlier in the episode. It's just a big old hound doggy. The warlock ends up being Nick. But Velma says there's another warlock. And she looks through a video camera and sees him in the stands with a briefcase. The dude actually just looks like a regular dude in a baby blue turtleneck. But when you look at him through Jimmy's glasses, he looks like the warlock because of a combination of TV magic and special formulas and lenses that help images appear. Apparently, Nick switched the glasses during last night's chase. Velma figured this out due to the receipt they found for special lenses. The reason the scepter kept appearing was because there were so many of them. The two warlock impersonators had carved them in that secret woodshop because this was before Amazon Prime. Now it all makes perfect sense, right? Velma takes the goatee off the other warlock in the baby blue turtleneck and we now see it's the gatekeeper, the one who looks like an elderly Morrissey. John, it turns out, is Nick's brother and they're both descended from the Anthos clan. You remember, those innocent people who were falsely accused of witchcraft and subsequently had their property stolen? We are distracted by the generations of woe because Scooby is making some very silly faces at himself in a mirror. Shaggy has him wear Jimmy's funky glasses and it makes him freak out, so he puts them on Shaggy so Shaggy can freak out too. And the story ends there. And now I need to go to Google for some fan fiction about those Anthos brothers and their struggles for both revenge and redemption. But first, I just want to thank Dave Seste for the use of our theme music, Night Surfing. I want to thank my awesome family, especially Mr. Olaf, my husband. I want to thank you amazing listeners. Thanks so much for tuning in to this ridiculous podcast and my crazy theories. 
I love hearing from you on social media. So join us on the Meddling Kids podcast and Scooby-Doo discussion group, moderated by one of my best friends, Tiff, because that's where you can share your weird recipes, theories about Scooby-Doo, and, you know, just kind of hang out with other fun people. Oh, and thanks for rating and subscribing on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. And remember, next time you're picking out a devil hound at the animal shelter, you would have gotten away with it if it weren't for us meddling kids.